Uh, welcome everybody. So let me introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Joseph Monich from the Institute of, of Astronomy, Charles University of uh, Czech Republic. So he he got uh, he got a PhD in 20, 2004, right? And he's He's now a uh, uh, associate professor in the Institute of Astronomy Charles University, and his main interest is uh, to to get uh, uh, to use the Leica and the high resolution ima uh, image image occultations and the thermal infrared data to get uh, more some, uh, to get some physical properties of the asteroids. So today he's going to to uh, introduce uh, the song, uh, the uh, his title of this pe uh, speaker uh, speech is the construction of actual shape and the spin states from the photometrics and the disk resolved data. So let's welcome to Dr. Joseph Durich. How? Oh, go ahead. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Thank you for uh, a nice introduction. And uh, most of all, thank you for inviting me to give this uh, seminar. As was said, uh, I'm going to talk about reconstruction of asteroid shapes and spin states from photometry and uh, disk resolved data, which is a topic that uh, I've been studying for a long time. And uh, <clears throat> the, the aim of my talk is to give an overview about these methods. So um, there are mainly two main parts. The, the first one will be devoted to asteroid light curve inversion as the main topic. Then I will show you some um, results that we obtained by analysis of spin axis distribution of asteroids. And then uh, in the second part, I, I'm going to talk about uh, disk resolved data and other types of observations. So I will start with uh, showing uh, some nice photographs of asteroids uh, just to demonstrate that asteroids come in various sh various shapes and, and sizes. Um, so I'm sure that uh, you must have seen these uh, snapshots uh, that were obtained by uh, space probes. Um, but of course, the, the number of asteroids that we can visit by space probes is very limited because it's expensive. So um, it's important to also study them uh, by remote sensing. So if I talk about asteroids, just uh, uh, imagine something like that, a, a rock of a size of a couple of kilometers or tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers of, uh, in general, irregular size or ir irregular shape, sorry. Um, another set of uh, photographs. Uh, now the, the pictures are not in scale. So for example, Eros is a large near-Earth asteroid, uh, uh, while Itokawa, a small near-Earth asteroid is only a uh, couple of hundreds of meters large. So there are, of course, differences between asteroids in, in shapes, in, in sizes, in surface. Uh, and the aim of remote sensing observations and the inversion techniques is to obtain as many or as much information as possible from uh, sometimes rather limited data sets. Um, to remind you about some, some numbers, um, currently there are more than uh, 800,000 known asteroids and for about half a million, we uh, already precisely know their orbit, so they are numbered. Um, and so th this is just the fact that there are very many asteroids known today. Uh, and they are discovered at the rate of, of about 100 new asteroids daily. And this, this will uh, increase in future with, with, for example, LSST telescope. So these numbers will grow definitely. Uh, for most of the, these bodies, the only thing we know is their orbit in the solar system. And from their brightness, we can somehow estimate their size. 
And as I said, the size uh, can be very different. The, the smallest known asteroids have diameters of a couple of meters, and the largest are hundreds to uh, about a thousand kilometers. Uh, for a subset of these asteroids, we know their rotation period from light curve observations, or about uh, 30,000 of them. And the rotation periods are typically of the order of hours, but uh, the range is also very wide from a couple of minutes for the smallest ones to hundreds of days. Um, and for a subset of these with known rotation period, we also know their approximate shape from mainly inversion of light curves or other techniques. Uh, but the subset is even smaller. So the, today the number is about uh, 3,000 or slightly more than 3,000. Uh, and for about only 50 asteroids, we know detailed shape uh, from the, the space probes I, I showed just before or from uh, adaptive optics images or radar uh, delay Doppler data. So looking at these numbers, it's obvious that there is a large discrepancy between the number of known bodies and the number of bodies for which we have at least some information. So this fact by itself is a strong motivation for further studies because we want, of course, to know more about the pop population. So apart from this uh, basic research motivation, um, asteroid shape reconstruction from light cars is an interesting problem uh, of applied mathematics. Uh, it's a nice example of an inverse problem, so that's uh, uh, a sufficient reason why to study asteroids. But of course, uh, uh, it has also implication for origin and evolution of the whole solar system. So the knowledge of, of asteroid physical properties is important for our picture or our understanding of the evolution of the uh, solar system. And there are also a more practical reason why to study asteroids. One of them is that uh, thermal emission, I'm going to talk about that later, thermal emission from asteroid surface affects its orbit. Uh, and this may be crucial for computing the probability or likelihood that uh, a particular asteroid will hit or won't hit the Earth. So this uh, knowledge of uh, spin state and, and shape are critical for com computing these uh, probabilities or risks. And uh, there is a also topic of uh, exploiting uh, asteroids as material resources in future, maybe even in the near future. So that would be a very practical use of asteroids. So let's let's start with asteroid light curves. Um, asteroids uh, on the sky they uh, they change brightness because they they rotate, and uh, apart from rotation, their brightness also depends on, uh, of course, the distance from the Earth and the Sun, uh, which is known because we know the the orbit and also on the mutual geometry, which is also known. So these, uh, the, the geometry of the illumination is known, uh, but what is not known is the shape, the rotation state, which is described uh, by the spin axis direction in uh, usually ecliptic coordinates, and the period of rotation. And of course, uh, the way how the surface reflects light. So these, Unknown, unknown parameters, they affect the light curve. Uh, and in principle, they can be reconstructed from light curves. So as I said, uh, the typical rotation period is of the order of hours, but can be very different. Uh, and here is an, just an example of how <coughs> an asteroid light curve looks like. Uh, <coughs> so typically we need many observations uh, from different epochs to, to sufficiently carry the changing ge geometry. So here's uh, a video showing the same thing that I just described by words, that uh, the, the shape of the light curve depends on the viewing and illumination geometry. So the body is the same, and when we look at the body, 
under different geometries, then the shape of the light curve is different. So our aim is to uh, reconstruct the, the shape from this integrated light, light curves. That's called the light curve inversion. Um, in, in theory or uh, mathematically, the, the light curves can be caused either by uh, an irregular shape or by albedo variance over the surface uh, or by a combination of both. Uh, and there would be no difference in this integrated data. For example, this shape that is uniformly gray and this sphere that is covered by <clears throat> this pattern of um, light and um, dark, <coughs> sorry, um, spots on, on, on its surface would produce exactly the same light curves from <clears throat> whatever direction. Fortunately, asteroids are mostly uniformly gray as, as we know from uh, space probes. So it simplifies our situation a lot because we can interpret uh, that brightness changes are caused mainly by shape and we can say that they are uniform, uniformly gray. gray. So again, uh, a video showing that the sphere on the left would produce the same light curve as, as the shape on the, on the right for whatever uh, viewing or illumination geometry. And there is no way how to distinguish between these two, uh, but in, an, in a reality, the asteroids look like elongated shapes, not like a, spheres covered by some pattern. Um, with, with the light curve inversion, we usually work with convex models because it's um, mathematically, it's more easy. Uh, moreover, it's mathematically stable and unique, the, the solution of, of the inverse, inverse problem. So from a set of light curves, typically tens observed under different geometries uh, to sufficiently cover the changing geometry, you can reconstruct the shape, the convex model, the spin axis direction, and the period. And as I said, this is called the light curve inversion. Um, and this technique, so technique was developed by Mikko Kasselainen more than 20 years ago. Um, the convex models are parameterized by this set of uh, normals that are isotropically distributed in space and corresponding areas uh, and this sum uh, has to be valid for a closed surface. So then these um, GI values can be interpreted as areas of uniformly uh, dark facets or uh, facets that, are, that have uniform or the same area or different reflectivity. But in practice, we interpret it as a, um, the same reflectivity with different areas. Because as I said, uh, we assume that the light curves are um, produced by elongated shapes, not albedo variation. And then uh, during the inversion process, we optimize these values to get the best agreement between the data and um, the, the observed data and our model. Uh, and then the, the result is uh, the, the shape that is described in so-called um, Gaussian image. So we have just a set of these uh, facet, facets and the 3D shape in vertex representation has to be reconstructed by another iterative process, uh, this Minkowski procedure. <clears throat> um, and the important thing is that this approach, working with convex models, is mathematically unique and stable with respect to the noise. So it's, it's uh, the main advantage. Here, uh, an example, um, shape reconstructed from 56 light curves or 53. So uh, the same set, 
but three light curves are missing in the set. And if you use that set to reconstruct the shape, you get this one or that one. Uh, or if you interpret the light curves as uh, albedo variation on a sphere, we get these two results. And it can be shown also, also like mathematically that the, uh, this solution in, in form of albedo pattern is uh, more sensitive to the noise. The solution is less stable with, uh, to, to differences in input data. And that's also why uh, it's mathematically safe to reconstruct convex models from disk integrated data. Of course, uh, one can also um, model the shapes as, as general non-convex bodies, but uh, then, then we lose this um, mathematical stability and uniqueness. And as is shown on this example of uh, asteroid Ivar, uh, the convex shape reconstructed from light curves and a non-convex model. So the non-convex model uh, produces some non-convex details, of course, but the problem is that uh, without knowing the real shape, you cannot just from the model safely say what details are real and what are just artifacts of, of the inversion. Because with, with slightly changing the input data, we get, we get usually different details and the details are all also sensitive to regularization. So it's kind of subjective procedure. And moreover, um, the differences between non-convex and, and convex models are apparent only for high uh, phase angles or and for highly non-convex bodies. So in practice, convex models are almost always sufficient. Uh, and that's why we use them mostly when, when inverting this integrated photometry. Um, So the, the method works and it also gives uh, results that are uh, consistent with reality as we can compare or demonstrate, for example, on this example of Itokawa for which we know the exact shape from Hayabusa mission and uh, below it is a convex reconstruction from light curves. So of course the convex model cannot describe any non-convex details, but the overall shape is, is similar to the real shape of Itokawa. And what is important that usually uh, the spin axis direction can be reconstructed uh, with the accuracy or precision of about a um, couple of degrees and that the sidereal rotation period uh, can be determined very accurately with precision of fraction of seconds. Uh, and th there was also a test of uh, a laboratory model of uh, asteroid shown here and the convex <clears throat> model reconstructed from uh, its um, light curves generated or measured in laboratory and this experiment showed that um, the result is not sensitive to the light scattering we assume for the surface because the light scattering properties of asteroid surfaces are not well known uh, but fortunately, they do not affect the spin and shape solution much, which is also good um, for the, the, the inversion. Um, and there is one important source of photometry that is called sparse photometry, because so far I, I have been talking about light curves and light curves are shown here uh, dense light curves uh, typically cover uh, the whole rotation period and we see the, 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 the light curve repeats and we see that there is some period that we can estimate from Fourier analysis of the signal. So we know where to search for the sidereal period because, because we have a good estimate from Fourier analysis. And, and these light curves are typically observed by dedicated observa observing campaigns for selected targets. Uh, uh, they are observed for, uh, by amateur astronomers uh, and there are light curves for tens of thousands of asteroids. Um, 
on the other hand, there is uh, this so-called sparse photometry where uh, we have typically measurements that are very sparse with, with respect to the uh, rotation period. So it means typically just a couple of brightness measurements per night. Uh, and then the Fourier analysis is difficult to, to do. Um, and we also, so, so we, we do not have any a priori information about the rotation period. So finding the rotation period takes time because we have to scan a wide range of possible uh, values. But this sparse photometry works the same way as, as light curves. They can be used for inversion. And uh, uh, as soon as we have more than about 100 points with sufficient uh, accuracy below, let's say, 5%, um, and a couple of years of observations to again cover the changing geometry, such data are sufficient for deriv deriving a unique convex model. And the advantage of this sparse photometry is that it is available essentially for all asteroids that are uh, observed by surveys. So this kind of data come from Gaia, from Atlas survey, ZTF, and in future for from LSST. So this is an important and rich source of photometric data. Uh, here is an example of inversion of sparse data. Uh, about 400 brightness measurements from tw 12 years. And uh, as I said, we have to search for the best period. So we have to scan all possible values. This is done in this case from two to 100 hours. And this rotation period provides the lowest residuals and it corresponds to the correct rotation period because for this asteroid, we know it from dense light curves. Um, so here is the shape reconstructed from 20 dense light curves. Uh, and at the bottom, um, the shape reconstructed from sparse data. So you see that uh, the model is uh, not so accurate, or it's, it's more coarse than the smooth model from light curves. But the rotation period was correctly determined, and also the rotation pole is very close to, to that determined from a set of dense light curves. Um, so th this sparse photometry is the main source of, of our models now. And as I said, we have more than 3,000 asteroids for which we have such convex shape and corresponding spin axis direction. Uh, so now, now we can look at some statistics of these poles, and uh, it has been already known that uh, the distribution of asteroid poles is far from being isotropic. And more, uh, more recently, it, it has been shown that it also depends on the, uh, the size of the body, that it's somehow correlated. Uh, so there is some clustering of uh, poles towards uh, directions to ecliptic poles. And this is explained by so-called Yorp evolution. Uh, and to explain what this is, uh, I need to introduce uh, thermal effects on asteroids. So this is a uh, something uh, we will return to the st statistics after discussing the thermal effects. Um, the distribution, because every asteroid is illuminated by sun, so there is some distribution of temperature on the surface. Uh, so in principle, every point at the surface, every surface area emits uh, thermal radiation as black body. Uh, so there is some force, reaction force to the surface that is that can be computed easily according to this equation. Uh, and if we integrate this force over the whole surface and average it uh, along the rotation and along the orbit, uh, in general, this is not zero. So th there is some net torque that on long time scales affects the orbit and changes the orbit. Uh, and similarly, there is a net torque that changes 
and circularity affects the uh, rotation. So this term corresponds to so-called Yarkovsky effect, and this torque uh, corresponds to Yorp effect. So this torque can affect the rotation, change the rotation period, and also change the direction of the spin axis. Uh, and the Yarkovsky effect, uh, again explained here, uh, basically is based on the thermal inertia of the surface and the fact that maximum temperature is not uh, at the place where the noon, the local noon is uh, directly illuminated by the sun, but later it's similar like at the earth. And due to this thermal inertia, there is, uh, as I said, some net force that in this case uh, accelerates the, the asteroid along its orbit. So for, for prograde rotators, the drift is outwards and in the semi-major axis of progradely rotating asteroids, they, they are increasing. For a retrograde asteroids that would rotate in a different or opposite sense, uh, the effect would be opposite uh, and it would lead to decreasing the semi-major axis. And this, this Yarkovsky effect is extremely important for uh, evolution of small bodies in the solar system and it's also important for precise ephemeris uh, orbit computation. Um, so, here is the distribution of uh, ecliptic latitudes beta for uh, those 3,000 asteroids for which we have this information. Uh, and if the distribution were isotropic, the, it would correspond to uniform uh, density of the points in this plot, which is not the case. Maybe here in that range of uh, something, the size is between 50 and 100 kilometers, it's maybe close to isotropic. But then it's uh, it's clearly un is isotropic uh, with clustering of the poles towards the ecliptic. So the, the beta is close or it has values close to 90 or minus 90 degrees in ecliptic latitude. And here is the ratio over some running box between prograde rotators and the total number of asteroids in that box. Uh, and it seems that smaller asteroids have more retrograde rotators uh, then then the ratio is about 50-50 uh, uh, in this area and then for larger asteroids there is an excess of prograde rotators uh, then we can look at the distribution of spins uh, in the main belt so here is Again, every point corresponds to a single asteroid. Uh, the spin is color coded, so prograde rotators are blue, retrograde are red. There are some gaps uh, at the places with mean motion resonances with, with Jupiter. Um, and I don't know if, if you see any pattern there. Um, it, it can be seen when we remove families, the members of collisional families. Uh, so then, close to resonances, uh, there are more blue points here on the left of the resonance and more red points on the right side of the resonance. And this exactly corresponds to the Yarkovsky effect because uh, <clears throat> uh, if the asteroid is, for example, retrograde rotator, so it, it's it's red, then it moves towards left in semi-major axis and it cannot cross this resonance, it's scattered. So uh, it gets close to the resonance and that's why there are more red points here. On the other hand, uh, the prograde rotators are on, on the left side of the resonance. So this distribution and also uh, the mean beta value, again, over some running box shows these uh, changes 
when, when crossing the resonance. And this, this picture agrees with this, with this interpretation as, as being caused by Yarkovsky effect. Um, a similar thing we can observe in asteroid families that uh, were created by uh, a large collision sometimes in the past. So now if we uh, select an asteroid family and plot it, its members, this is for example Femis family, if we plot its members uh, uh, as uh, points in this uh, proper semi-major axis versus H magnitude, uh, we usually get this what is called V-shape and it's also a result of uh, Yarkovsky evolution because uh, the higher the H magnitude the smaller the asteroid is and Yarkovsky is proportional to one over diameter so it affects more um, sig significantly smaller asteroids that move faster due to this effect and the spread is more important for small asteroids. And if this works, then we should observe prograde rotators on the right of the center of family and retrograde on the left. So let's see if this is true. Uh, I selected, of course, examples where this is true and we can demonstrate this fact that it, it works. So I selected four families. Uh, these, the, the, the gray points are all asteroids that belong to uh, a given family and these colored points are asteroids for which we have a shape model and information about their spin direction. So you see that indeed uh, on average uh, retrograde rotators that are <coughs> red points are uh, on the left of, from the center and blue points are to the right. <clears throat> so now uh, let's move to multi-data inversion. Let's, let's talk a bit about other techniques that we can use or other data types that, that we can use uh, for shape reconstruction. So photometry is the most important source because it's available basically uh, for almost all known asteroids through this sparse photometry. But of course the information in photometry is limited so to get so more details about asteroid shapes, we need disk resolve data uh, that come in form of adaptive optics images or occultation silhouettes. You can use also thermal infrared observations to get albedo size and thermal properties, um, delayed Doppler radar echoes, interferometry from ALMA and of course uh, flyby imaging. The inverse problem is, um, uh, again, the same. We try to minimize some chi-square that is defined as the difference between the model and our observations. And in general case, the total chi-square is, chi is composed of individual contributions from individual data modes. And usually we need to include also some regularization terms. And then there are different ways how to find the minimum. We can use different shape representation, different techniques for finding the minimum in chi-squared. Uh, but uh, generally we want to minimize this left side chi-squared total. And of course the level of detail we can reconstruct depends on the information content of the input data. So from sparse photometry, we can get only uh, um, an approximate shape that can be improved if uh, dense light curves are available. If we have two-dimensional data, we can reconstruct some non-convex details. And with flyby, uh, of course, we see the, the shape and we have information about very small details on the surface. Um, recently, there are impressive results from adaptive optics images, uh, mainly from this ESO, ESO VLT sphere instrument. Uh, and here is an example of, on the left side, is a uh, image uh, of asteroid Vesta 
observed by, by this sphere instrument. Uh, and on the right side is uh, the real shape, uh, because we know the real shape from the Dawn mission, illuminate, illuminated uh, under same condition. So we can compare the like perfect image with what we observed with, with sphere. And you see that the, the resolution in, is impressive. This is this bar here is um, the theoretical resolution of that eight meter VLT telescope. And in fact, the resolution on the limb is even better than this theoretical resolution. So this, this uh, really remains more cartography than, than inverse problem. Another example with the same sphere instrument of uh, asteroid Iris, where we really see craters and we can count them and do some statistics. And these result were, results were uh, published last year by uh, Vernaza et al. And the result uh, are detailed shape models of more than 40 main belt asteroids, the largest ones. Uh, and for many of them, we have also information about density because the mass is known. Um, other techniques that can be used to, to see how the asteroid look like is the occultations. So um, occultations, they, they require more observers or many observers that are spread across the, the path of the shadow on the Earth. Uh, and if, the, if, such occult, if such observations are successful, then uh, the silhouette can be reconstructed and then compared, for example, uh, with, the, with the shape model and the shape model can be scaled like in this, in this case. So this is the shape model of uh, one asteroid that is uh, projected uh, at the time of observation. And these chords here are individual observers that observe that occultation. And even if the, the match is not perfect, then uh, the agreement is overall good and we can scale the model to the correct size. Or if there are uh, two pole, pole solutions, which is uh, common uh, for models derived from photometry, that we have two pole solutions and we cannot distinguish between them. Then these two pole solutions and, and corresponding shapes, they provide different silhouettes. One is blue here and one is this dashed uh, magenta. And in this case, we see that the occultation scores, these, these lines, they agree with only one Pole, one shape model, so we can uh, reject the second one and also scale uh, the shape. Um, another rich source of information are infrared data uh, that enable us to, uh, to estimate the size because from photometry itself, it's not possible to determine the, the, the size of the asteroid. We can reconstruct the shape, but the shape is scale-free because the flux, if you measure it, is uh, uh, dependent on area and albedo, and albedo is not known, so there is this uh, um, uh, this de degeneracy between area and albedo. And only with thermal, in, thermal data that are mainly from WISE um, satellite, uh, the thermal data are not sensitive to reflectivity and we can derive very accurately the diameter. And apart from diameter, we can also say something about the thermal properties of the surface that are usually uh, described by, by this capital gamma parameter, the thermal inertia, which is a combination of uh, thermal conductivity of the surface, its uh, density and heat capacity. And this gamma uh, corresponds to, uh, to the regulative to, or to, to the fact if the surface is covered 
with regulate with final regulate or if it's more rocky so there is a general trend between the value of gamma and uh, uh, the roughness or the the fact if for for low gamma uh, the the surface is covered with fine regulate and for high gamma values uh, there is coarse regulate and boulders mainly here is a, an example of a successful inversion of uh, light curves and thermal data for asteroid Lutetia, uh, for which we can compare the, the result with the real shape imaged by Rosetta spacecraft. So here is the comparison of uh, the real shape that is gray, and on top of that is uh, plotted the convex model that was reconstructed from visual light curves and thermal infrared data. Uh, the result was a shape with the diameter of 103 kilometers, while the real shape is uh, five kilometer, kilometers smaller. But the agreement overall is very good, and the thermal inertia and geometric albedo also derived from thermal data, disk integrated data, they also agree with the values um, measured by Rosetta. Um, another example is uh, asteroid unitas for which we have uh, 15 light curves and uh, some thermal infrared measurements that are plotted here from IRAS and, and WISE. And the number of uh, thermal measurements is, is not large, but still the data enable us to correctly scale the, the shape model. Uh, so here you can see the fit between the black measurements and uh, the flux is predicted by the best fit model that are in red. And this is the resulting shape reconstructed from those light curves and thermal inf infrared data. And in, in this case, the, the shape is scaled to some, some value and we can compare it directly with occultations. Uh, or with one, one occultation from 2004, uh, which is uh, an independent check of uh, if, if the size we derive from thermal data is correct or not. And in this case, it's correct because um, it gives the value of 50, value of 51 kilometers, uh, the best fit if we scale the model according to occultation is, is uh, 50 and uh, here are the values provided by uh, three infrared surveys based on de their analysis. Um, another powerful technique is uh, to use echoes, radar echoes uh, from near-earth asteroids to uh, to reconstruct the shapes, uh, but um, the main instrument used for this for Arecibo that collapsed and uh, you can no more use it. So the question is if Goldstone itself will be capable uh, of continuing this research. But the, the results so far were amazing and the, the details uh, reconstructed from these delay Doppler images were uh, really just a fraction of the size of the whole body. So the resolution was really impressive. And um, the, the last example I am going to show you is uh, asteroid Cleopatra, which is a very nice example for uh, of an asteroid for which we have multiple sources of uh, data, there are adaptive optics observations shown here, uh, occultations from different years showing the projection at different times. Of course, we have a large set of light curves and also uh, radar observations from Arecibo. And from this very rich set of data, uh, it was possible to reconstruct a detailed shape of Cleopatra uh, 
so we know exactly the shape and the rotation state. And there are also two satellites orbiting Cleopatra. So from astrometric measurements, positions of, of these satellites and their evolution over years, we can in fact um, determine exactly the mass of the body, thus the density. And in principle, uh, when the observations are accurate, it can lead to uh, something like uh, determining the, the changes of the density inside the body because it affects the orbits of the moons. So um, to conclude, I would say that uh, this research of uh, asteroid shapes and their properties from remote sensing data goes in, in two directions. One is uh, population studies where the aim is to derive as many model, models as possible to study the distribution of spins across the population in, in asteroid families to study how Europe effect, uh, affects the, the spins and their evolution. And we can expect a dramatic increase in amount and quality of photometry uh, because more amateur astronomers are involved in this and also uh, surveys, for example, Gaia or in future LSST will contribute dramatically to, to uh, this data. Uh, and another direction is uh, studying individual asteroids with uh, disk resolved techniques, mainly adaptive optics. Uh, I already mentioned this as so large program that uh, resulted in detailed models of more than 40 asteroids. Occultations are more and more important because their predictions are more and more accurate. Uh, the question is if radar will uh, be so important in the future as it was in the past. And of course, uh, flyby uh, missions or rendezvous missions will be uh, the best way how to study asteroids. Uh, uh, but it's the topic of the next talk of Patrick Michel. So I would end here and Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you for your uh, Dr. Joseph Dulich. So, any idea? Have a question? You can raise your hand or type in the chat box. I can ask for you. Okay, before before the audience uh, ask the question, can I ask you some several questions? So, so far, do we have uh, some shared model for the binary system or uh, triple system of asteroid? Yes, uh, I, I didn't mention it. There are um, the best models uh, we have for binary systems come from radar observation. So there are some systems that were observed by Arecibo and uh, people were able to reconstruct the, the shapes of the components and also the orbit. Um, so these are detailed uh, non-convex shapes. And we have some models uh, from photometry, uh, of course, that they are mainly limited to modeling the binary system as two ellipsoids. Because from photometry, you can't get much more information in uh, regarding binary system. So, this is something that people at Ondřejov in Czech Republic do to process photometry of uh, mutual events in, in binary system and then reconstruct the orbits and the sizes of the components. So another question is, uh, how about the apt uh, AOC, AO de detect detections? So did, is any limits uh, size? for these detections, something like a 50 kilometers, uh, 50 kilometer diameter, or it depends the, the how far away to to the Earth, Earth distance when yes, doing the observations? It, it, uh, it depends. Uh, there is some limiting brightness, that is one thing, but uh, it's, uh, then there, then there, there is some resolution of the system. So the larger the asteroid is, the better, and the closer it is, the better. So in practice, the smallest asteroids uh, uh, imaged in that large program were uh, 
I don't know, 50 kilometers, something like that, because then you can still image smaller asteroids, but then you don't see any, any details on the surface. Okay, so I see the audience from uh, Xiaoping, Lu, Lu Xiaoping from uh, Macau. So go ahead. Okay, uh, thanks, Zheng Yi. Hi, uh, Professor mm -hmm. Joseph Drich. I'm from uh, Macau University. Uh, my, my name is uh, Lu Xiaoping. Yeah, uh, I do uh, want to say hello to you, and I really appreciate your huge contribution in the uh pro Thank in you. providing us uh for the light curves uh, through the uh damn it website and uh, in, in my previous uh research on asteroid shape model uh i uh, yeah, uh i uh, have uh, pre presented uh, a new shape model we call the silinoid Okay, we cooperate with uh, Professor Albert Hustelino. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, during the, the, the initial research, uh, I have uh, used many data uh, and checked my model uh, through the DEMIT website. And uh, yeah, I, I actually do wish to meet you in some way, uh, in some meeting or in some other uh, chance. So, so uh, yeah, today this is a special chance to meet you through the uh, online. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, uh, yeah, it's about more than uh, more than ten years since I visit Professor uh, Miko Casalini in, mm -hmm. in in Finland. So uh, I heard your name uh, by by uh, his introduction. So. Uh, Okay. Uh, actually, I, I do. Uh, uh, recently, we are uh, we are trying to uh, uh, investigate the binary model from the photometric uh, uh, observations. But uh, now uh, there is a, a big obstacle for us is the data. <laughs> so mm -hmm. actually, we cannot find enough data for some binary asteroid. So could we? please give me some suggestions uh for figure out this this uh obstacle well well the data data are a problem so if uh, if the data are not available then i don't know what to do you have to observe it again okay. or ask for cooperation somebody uh, i think the, that most people now if they observe an asteroid they they provide the data to some archive so um, if if the data are not anywhere that probably it means that nobody observed that asteroid and then yeah you have to yeah. do it yourself or wait for some surveys okay got it and i noticed that the most uh light curve uh, collected is the damage website uh, the light curve is recorded in the uh, relative uh brightness so uh so we have to use this data uh to uh, uh use uh yeah uh, use a uh, relative mode uh it, it means that uh, we have to uh use the the special uh chi square uh chi square calculations with the divided by the mean of the light curve brightness right mm -hmm. so is there uh some way for for your team to handle the uh the calibrated data and the relative data yes yeah, am uh, i clear <laughs> yeah the, the the calibrated data are always better because they they contain more information but in practice they are rare because most light curves we have they they are not calibrated so we treat them as relative light curves Mm -hmm. But if, if yeah. absolutely calibrated data are available, then it's easy to include them into the inversion and use them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and uh, my fin uh, final question is about the hyperparameter. And you, you mentioned that you can uh, use the multi multiple data into your inverse process. So <clears throat> it means you have to choose the different weights for the different kind of the data. Mm -hmm. So the hyperparameters, uh, it, uh, it, it, it means the weights between the different kinds of data. So it's a very time consuming work. So how 
how uh, your teams to to do that? Well, it's I would say that it, it's based on experience that that oh, you okay. uh, th there are like objective ways how to set up the weights between the data, but usually we work. Uh, just by trial and error approach that uh, you set up the weight somehow and then you see that some data sets do not fit so you increase the weight for them and then somehow iteratively converge to the solution that uh, that fits everything as good as possible or as well as possible okay so, okay got it yeah yeah <laughs> I know. okay Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Joseph Durace. Okay, yeah. Thank you for okay. your uh, excellent speech. Thank you for your interest. I see that there is a question in the chat box. So from the student, Xu Zhenyan. So she, she said, is there any limitation for fast rotated object? Yes, the, there, is a, there is a limit. If, if you plot the, the rotation period of periods of asteroids with respect to their size, there is an apparent sharp limit of about two hours. So asteroids larger than a couple of hundreds of meters, they uh, almost never rotate faster than, than two hours. And this is interpreted as a, uh, as a, uh, an evidence for they are so-called rubber pile structures, so they, they are uh, held together mainly by gravity. Uh, and this, this two-hour period corresponds to density, something like two grams per cubic centimeter. So if, uh, if the body is or were rotating faster, it would shed mass and, and disrupt. So those asteroids that rotate faster than uh, two hours, the rotation can be of the order of minutes for them, but they, they have to be small. So they are typically uh, tens of meters small asteroids that can rotate really fast and they have to be monolithic to sustain uh, such fast rotation. And it seems that there is no, no limit on how fast they can rotate. Uh, the, the the fastest ones are of the order of minutes. Okay, so 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 I I, I got the uh, one question about this. So, so can I say most of the, the near Earth asteroids they are smaller, and uh, they probably have uh, some very fast rotator periods. I think I, I don't know how how many how many near Earth asteroids uh, period have been estimate uh, have been derived, do you know? Uh, I don't know exactly, but uh, I would say thousands, hundreds at least. And um, so that it's for, for near, uh, near Earth asteroids is the same, that, that there is this limit and those that are larger than a couple of hundreds of meters, they do not rotate fast. Uh, okay. So only the, the smallest ones, that, that are below that limit of, let's say, 200 meters, they can rotate fast, but they, they, they can also rotate slowly. So there is no rule saying that if it's small, it has to rotate fast. It just can. Okay, so any, also if you have a, a question to the Joseph Dorich, you can email to me and I can trans translate to, to, to him. So anyway, so, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Dorich again. Okay.